Conspiracy Unlimited with Richard Serrett. They noticed this giant wolf that just meandered up to them like it was a pet. And then it approached a calf and actually attacked calf around its throat. And, uh, you know, they tried kicking this wolf. I guess it was like a dire wolf. Now, these things haven't been seen in 10,000 years. Uh, This is an extinct creature. He gets his handgun uh, and uh, he shoots at point blank range about three times. And this is a 357 Magnum, reportedly. This is a powerful gun. Correct, yes. And, you know, that should have got the thing off. It should have you know, killed it. And uh, that had no effect. And uh, he had got his hunting rifle and he shot the thing uh, again with the hunting rifle. And, uh, the, you know, th- these rounds would have brought down an elk easily. Um, and this thing. Eventually, let, let go of this poor calf that was bleeding profusely, and it just started wandering off out into the pasture, and I guess they were stunned. They couldn't believe their eyes what had just happened. Did you know you can now stream episodes of this podcast on your mobile device? All you need is my new Conspiracy Unlimited app. It's absolutely free, and it's available for both iOS and Android devices. If you're a Conspiracy Unlimited Plus member, pay attention. You can now stream premium content from your mobile device. My free Conspiracy Unlimited app for iOS and Android. Available from the App Store and Google Play. Get yours today and start streaming Conspiracy Unlimited on your mobile device. Conspiracy Unlimited with Richard Serrett. Pursuing the truth wherever it leads. Exposing evil and corruption and the secret machinations of powerful elites. Revealing the high strangeness beneath the surface of our supposed reality. Coming to you from his studio beneath the stairs. Here's Richard Serrett. Mark Capel is standing by on the line from his home in New Zealand to talk about the Skinwalker Ranch, the legendary fabled ranch located in uh, in Utah, which is a real hotbed, that's an understatement, of paranormal activity, UFO sightings, cryptids, Bigfoot sightings, for example, the Skinwalkers, this Native American legend that certain Native Americans have this ability to shapeshift, poltergeist activity, I mean, you name it, everything in the kitchen sink in terms of the paranormal has been seen, experienced, documented at the Skinwalker Ranch. Mark Capel is originally from New Zealand. He's actually a dual citizen, New Zealand and the United States. He's lived around the world on sea and land. He's a licensed technician class ham radio operator, certified scuba diver, graphic artist, videographer, photographer, paranormal researcher, investigator, UFO hunter, drone operator. He's written a paper on near-death experiences, a newspaper journalist, an honor student while he attended Brigham Young University, and uh, an independent filmmaker, an amateur aerospace inventor. As a boy, Mark had a keen interest in the space sciences and expressed uh, that to his deputy principal in the school he attended in Auckland, New Zealand. In conversation, he said he would like to send something into space. And this led Mark to be the creator of Black Sky Project, the world's first prototype near space balloon solar rocket made mostly from off-the-shelf parts and devices that can be purchased online. The goal of Black Sky Project is to test a prototype propulsion system to discover if it's possible to use such a craft for high-altitude experiments, observations, and possibly break some altitude, altitude records in the process. Wasn't that what they were trying to do with those high altitude observation balloons at Roswell. (laughs) Uh, Potentially, it will create a new category of unmanned near spacecraft and may be the first balloon to rocket into space under its own power. Now, that's just cool. He's also been involved in clearing negative energy from several people's homes, including a doctor and a dentist. Having been a victim of, including a poltergeist in New Zealand, supernatural attacks, Mark has compassion for those dealing with supernatural energies. He's also about helping the lost souls out of their mental prisons if they want or need help. Skinwalker Ranch, known as one of the hottest zones in the world world for paranormal activity, as I mentioned, including UFOs, poltergeist activity, Bigfoot-like creatures, interdimensional portals and cryptids, 
uh, became a new topic of study in 2013. There have been various books, TV and radio shows about the property that the Sherman family, who was a cattle rancher, they were terrorized uh, and moved from uh, this uh, area in 1996 after having lived there for about two years. And at that point, billionaire and entrepreneur Robert Bigelow purchased the property from the Shermans to study the phenomena with his team of uh, doctorate-level scientists. It's the area of the Ute Indians and has a high amount of UFO sightings by the people that live in the area. Uh, Neighbors have witnessed similar phenomena as the uh, Shermans had, as well as cattle mutilations. Uh, But the intelligence seemed to outwit the researchers and camera technology. Upon a three-day visit, Mark experienced EVPs, electric or electronic voice phenomena, and a likely Bigfoot encounter, as well as capturing light anomalies on camera. And he's here to tell us about all of this, uh, which he has um, documented in his new documentary film, Skinwalker Ranch, Apocalypse Close Encounters, which includes ghostly voices, out-of-place anomalies, interviews with locals, as well as possible as a possible Bigfoot encounter. Wow. Can't wait for this conversation. Mark Capel, welcome. How are you? Hi there, Richard. Uh, thank you for uh, having me on your show. I'm doing uh, pretty good. Now, where have we reached you tonight? Are you in New Zealand? Uh, yes, I am talking to you from Auckland, New Zealand. Wonderful to have you with us. So, uh, tell me about your your first trip there to uh, Skinwalker Ranch, and what, what took you there? Well, um, uh, back in 2013, um, I had had a close encounter uh, with a, a silver oblong-shaped craft uh, over in the southern Nevada desert out when I was uh, prospecting. You know, I had all my gear on. I was out in the desert. And um, that experience kind of really shook me up. Um, I've had many supernatural experiences uh, growing up, uh, as you've read, and uh, uh, I became very interested in ufology. And um, I actually uh, went to a lot of uh, MUFON events, and uh, I, I, I would go out sky watching with the uh, Las Vegas UFO hunters and uh, I uh, saw some very interesting things, and uh, I, I found out about uh, Skinwalker Ranch. I, I believe it was one of uh, George Knapp's um, uh, old radio broadcasts. Oh, him. yeah. He's been on the forefront, really, of, of investigating that. That's for sure. Oh, yes. yes it's, it's a fascinating uh, story. Uh, you know, it's, it's so much happened there that it's, uh, you know, I can understand why people would, um, uh, you know, listen uh, with uh, disbelief uh, unless you had something happen yourself so how do how does one i mean do you have to be invited to go out it's, it's still owned by robert bigelow is it not uh from my understanding he still owns the property uh i don't know if uh if uh nids uh, the national institute for discovery sciences team i don't know if they if they are doing any more um observations uh, i know his uh security guards uh, do take reports but uh, my understanding is he still owns the property uh it is a formidable place to go to you go there uh when we went there um uh believe it was on the saturday and um uh, the the guards came up to the front gate and they stared us down they actually sent black dogs out at us running up to us we were parked on um public land uh public road there uh, they've uh, actually put barricades, and there's all these no trespassing signs. Uh, there's so many no pre- trespassing signs there. It's uh, it's kind of amusing when you see that. But uh, hmm. it sounds uh, like Area 51. It is. Uh, it's pretty much the Area 51 of the paranormal. So you weren't obviously you weren't invited. You weren't expected. You just showed up. But I mean, wouldn't it have been easier to just to get permission? Or is that not possible these days, to get permission to go there and, and investigate? Good question. It would be pretty much impossible. The only person, uh, the only reporter that's uh, been on there has been George Knapp. Um, everybody else, uh, I believe uh, Joe Jr. Hicks, a uh, retired school teacher, I believe that uh, he was allowed on the, the property in the early days. But uh, from my understanding, um, outsiders are strictly forbidden. And again, uninvited, so you're met with uh, sort of a flanx of security, uh, attack dogs and don't trespass signs and keep out and barbed wire and all of that. But, but one would have to think that, uh, you know, whatever is going on at Skinwalker Ranch doesn't just end at the fence line. I mean, this there must be something 
you know, that's spilling out over the actual boundary of the Skinwalker Ranch that you would be able to observe. Is that the idea, what you were anticipating, that you, as long as you're in the area, you're going to be able to, you know, to see something, experience something? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, many people have had experiences um, in the um, outlying properties around there. Um, I did interview with um, Larry Sisbridge, who's a spiritual leader of the uh, Ute tribe locally there, and uh, he was telling me about, about some of his experiences. Um, that according to the Ute, there's always been very strange, anomalous activity that's uh, taken place there. So when I uh, left to go there with my girlfriend, um, I figured, well, there's, you know, there's a, there's a chance that something may or may not happen um, off property. Now, I know there are people that do trespass, but it's very dangerous. Uh, it is guarded by ex-military guards uh, who probably get very bored um, guarding the uh, boundary. No question. And you had a, your girlfriend agreed to go with you? Uh, yes, she's pretty brave. Um, actually, the uh, year before, um, she saw someone almost get killed with me uh, during a paranormal investigation. Uh, I, I have a YouTube channel, and uh, a man, when, when you actually got lured up a, a ladder uh, over the ghost box, you can hear the conversation. Um, and uh, he actually got pushed on the edge of this uh, uh, platform inside this mine. So, yes, she's pretty brave to come with me. And I did tell her that I, I have a lot of... Um, um, experience with um, paranormal activity and that uh, she sh- shouldn't be too surprised if she should happen to see ghosts. And how, where were you staying? Were you camping out adjacent to the property? or how, Where were you staying? Um, no, we just uh, stayed in a uh, local motel. Uh, however, uh, at night we did um, go and um, park in legal areas. Uh, you know, we didn't uh, trespass the boundary there. We, uh, we, we got as close as we could. Uh, which you know happened to be like a mile, a mile and a half away. That's a yeah, pretty good distance. But right. People do have experiences there. And the ranch is what about 450, 500 acres? Uh, it's about 480 acres. Okay. All right. So the, uh, tell me. So you've got uh, you've got what infrared cameras that sort of thing. How are you How are you hoping to document whatever you might see? Well, um, I went there with with the point of whatever happens. I want to capture it on video. Um, I had uh, an array of different kinds of cameras. I had a Spectre cam that's used in ghost hunting that actually tracks any kind of movement uh, full spectrum. I had a, um, an infrared uh, point of view camera that I uh, had on my head that I wore, um, but I only had a battery life of about two hours. But uh, uh, I did actually capture some strange things that happened uh, and then of course I uh, you know I had audio recording devices I had my SLR that would uh, I would do star lap photography I was hoping to capture maybe something like UFO like or something any uh, any weapons I mean how how did you intend to defend yourself you know whatever you might find out there I went there I actually did practice some um, some self-protection rituals uh, I've I've had uh, problems with entities in the past so I I, I know how to deal pretty well with them, um, so I, I did go there um, with that in mind. That was one of the foremost things was was safety. Now, when I went there, it was actually very windy. Um, it, it was kind of very frustrating because, you know, wind does come across microphones very, uh, very annoyingly loud. That's true, right? Unless you have like a wind sock or something on there. All right, so let's let's cut right to the chase and tell us about uh, the first night. That you actually captured something on 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 video or on some sort of a recording device. What did you see? What did you hear? Well, um, as I say, it was windy. It was so windy. Um, you know, my car was rocking uh, sideways, uh, um, and I actually went to the spot called uh, Southern Vantage, um, and that is about a mile and a half from uh, south from the Skinwalker Ranch, and uh, I actually went uh, and just sat. Uh, in the open desert, uh, and I had my cameras all set up. Um, you know, I didn't know, you know, what was going to happen. I, I tried not to have any expectations. Uh, of course, when you're in the in, in darkness like that, you, your mind can kind of uh, play tricks on you. However, I did notice 
these strange light anomalies that would come up close to me and would shoot straight past me. And I thought, well, you know, maybe it's something just, you know, blowing past me in the wind. Now, the funny thing about this one particular anomaly that I captured uh, on my side uh, point of view camera was that it actually flew against the wind. The wind was very gusty. Any bird or insect would have just been blown, of course. Uh, I thought that it was possibly car headlights from behind me, but when I uh, estimated on, on Google Earth, just the, the angle that they came at me, uh, it, it didn't match that. And uh, this uh, anomaly actually lit up my face as it went past. Now, it happened very quickly, and um, I... I did review the, the footage, and it just comes across as kind of very strange and unusual. And, uh, I mean, what would differentiate, other than the you say the angle wasn't right, what would differentiate these from, from head, car headlights? Did they, w- were they, like, was there a pair, a pair of them? I mean, headlights, right? You've got two. They're, they're sort of locked in position. I mean, were they, were these lights... Flitting around, were they uh, were they in straight lines? Well, uh, what I saw was, uh, and actually, it's just a single light, um, and, and it came straight head on to me, uh, almost like a uh, a motorcycle uh, headlight. Now it moved very quickly, um, and then it kind of went sideways. It, it turned like right in front of my face, and if if, if, if you look at the the video in my documentary, and you you know, you look at, I slide down, uh, you can see the side of my face gets lit up by this anomaly, and uh, it goes straight past me, like it was deliberate. Now, if it had been car headlights, you know, I, I should have had been able to see something in front of me that it would have reflected off, but there was nothing directly in, f- in front of me that would have lit up like that. And presumably, if it was a motorcycle, you would have heard it. Uh, uh, you know, at night in the desert, sounds travel great distances. I do know that. Uh, okay, so so then, what other experiences did you have? Did you? I mean, let's let's talk about uh, this Bigfoot sighting, this Bigfoot encounter that you may have had. Yes, um, that occurred on the second night. We uh, went to a, a different location that, uh, known as um, UFO Hill by locals. Uh, this is uh, about oh, about a mile and a half or so um, northwest of Skinwalker Ranch. Now you can't see the actual ranch itself from this vantage point. However, you can see the the skies directly above it and the ridge. And there's actually uh, an array of power lines right by there. And there's the, the occasional house um, out there on the, the property. Um, now. We had set the cameras up uh, on top of the cell. Now, there was a very steep drop uh, right below where we were. It was about a 40, 50-foot drop, very dangerous. You know, you don't want to stand in the wrong place. Uh, I had set up all my cameras, and um, we actually had a, a tribal police officer pull up and started taking photos of my car. Uh, he didn't see us up there. I, I carefully approached him and just let him know who we were. But, however... Um, we, uh, you know, when I went back to recording and that, uh, we were just, you know, sitting there just kind of watching the cameras and uh, Michelle was, uh, I had my XA-10 um, HD camera that she was kind of uh, focusing on the tripod and that and all of a sudden we hear this, like an explosion and, um, and, and we caught this on the sound on two cameras um, and it was weird, I was like, what on earth was that? And, you know, you know trying to think logically, well, okay, you know, maybe it was a battery pack that had exploded. So I went and checked my uh, battery packs. No, they all worked. And um, I really had to scratch my head about that. I really, you know, I didn't know what to make of it. I mean, there was a utility pole close to us. So I thought, well, you know, maybe there was something electrical. Um, but it wasn't until I actually went over the, the footage that, you know, I realized what it was. Now, I'd, I would like to make a side note here that... Uh, as we sat in this, this place, um, we heard some very strange animal noises. Um, and I thought, well, you know, there's all kinds of animals out here. It could be anything. Well, I heard something that sounded like, I could best describe as like a Wookiee, a Wookiee of Star Wars. Um, not long after I heard this explosion sound. A Wookiee, that, uh, that would be that uh, would be like Chewbacca, right? Is he a Chewbacca, Wookiee? Chewbacca, correct. Okay. Yeah. 
I All mean, right. that's the best I can describe the sound. You know, you know, maybe, you know, maybe there's another explanation for what, what the kind of animal this was. I, I did put the footage up online um, to see if anybody could, uh, you know, would recognise it. No one's come forth to recognise it, and I did contact some um, Bigfoot researchers, and nobody, nobody responded as to what it was. You mean you put uh, the audio? The audio is what you hear. You don't see anything. You just hear the. This 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 sound. Correct. Right. Yes. It, um, it just it was really weird. I mean, I've never heard anything like it before. But you know, I'm not used to the wildlife there in Utah, so I figured, well, you know, maybe it maybe it was some kind of wildlife. But it just it was kind of weird, you know, and especially with the, the situation. Um, um, now, also, I've done uh, ghost box sessions too. I don't know if you've heard of the ghost box. Before, like Frank I, Frank's box, uh, sometimes referred to as Frank's box. Is that the same uh, thing? Yes, yes, pretty okay. much. I mean, there's different kinds that you can get, but I used uh, Faraday material to kind of block out most of the radio signals because that gets very confusing. But um, I've got very strange recordings. Um, uh, EVPs that I picked up, and I picked up like growls. And, um, uh, I got one voice that picked up and said, "Hi, Mark." <laughs> this, this is near I, the ranch. You're talking. This isn't a this isn't a, a previous investigation. This is at the near the ranch. Um, this was uh, at that that location on right. UFO Hill that okay. I picked up. Hi, Mark. And um, I, I picked up um, other things like uh, uh, one voice said, "Monocular." And I, because I, I asked, I said, you know, will you guys please show me some sort of UFO craft? And a voice that comes across, it says, yes, it was really weird. And then it said, another voice said, monocular. Well, I've got, you know, monocular there. I've got a digital night vision monocular, you know. So it's like describing my equipment. Hmm. Now, uh, aside from those EVPs, uh, anything further to the the, the but the possible Bigfoot encounter? I mean, did you see anything? Um, no, I can't say I've saw anything visually. I mean, it was just uh, audio. I I did have the strange feeling up there of being watched by something, and it was kind of an airy feeling. I thought, well, maybe it was something you know, kind of psychological. You you're out in the wilderness in a very dark area, and uh, where things happen, that you know, maybe it was something psychological. But uh, what was just weird was just the uh, you know going back over the the footage and uh, that sound was actually the sound of a rock hitting the ground. It was a a pretty large rock. Um, you know, as a kid, I we we used to throw stones at each other um, with the neighborhood kids and and um, so I'm familiar with you know what rocks sound like when they get thrown, but this thing was pretty loud. I mean, it was like an explosion. So uh, whatever threw it had some strength to it and uh you know i surmise it must be something like a like a shot pot kind of weight and you know those, those aren't you know those aren't easy to throw and this was being thrown in your direction yes right by us well we've heard countless stories about uh sasquatch or or, or bigfoot uh, throwing rocks they do like to throw rocks Yes, that's that's very true. That is um, one of the signs of um, you know Bigfoot's. Uh, you know they're missing with you or they're testing you out. And, you know the funny thing is I went there to hoping to get like maybe UFO on camera. Instead, I have a possible Bigfoot uh, encounter. Uh, the name Skinwalker, and I mentioned you know the the, the Native American legend, but w- tell us a little bit more about. We are coming up on a break. We'll start this conversation right now, and then we'll continue continue after the break. But t- talk to me about the legend of the Skinwalker and where the ranch gets that name. Okay. Well, um, apparently um, Terry uh, had been talking to one of his shaman friends, um, and uh, he, I guess, was discussing what had happened. And um, he was told... Um, that the the area was considered unholy ground and was on the path of the skinwalkers. Now, and that it was an area of spirits and spooks. Uh, and also, Larry uh, Sisbooch had you know talked to me a little bit about uh, what a skinwalker is. Um, and I didn't, to be honest, I didn't really know much about it. But uh, I understand that it is a Navajo uh, term, and uh, uh, apparently from um, Ute tradition that uh, they 
had some bad blood between them and the, the Navajo in the past, and uh, apparently the Navajos, uh, in, in retribution, had sent the skinwalker or these skinwalkers, uh, like a shape-shifting witch kind of creature, uh, to them to torment them. And apparently they're very evil creatures, and they can uh, transform. Uh, I mean, that's my understanding of what they are. And did you talk to any locals who had actually seen a skinwalker? Um, I can't say I've talked with anyone that admitted seeing them, but, I mean, I had read of accounts of uh, creatures kind of walking across the street um, that were kind of like, well, maybe kind of Bigfoot kind of like, that, you know, at the time the person thought that uh, that it was Skinwalker. Um, I, I, I still, there's a big question mark over me. As to what we're dealing with, are they Bigfoot or are they Skinwalkers? All right, listen, yeah. we'll uh, we'll take a time out, Mark, and we'll come back and continue to delve into the Skinwalker Ranch Apocalypse Close Encounters with Mark Capel joining us from New Zealand. Hey there, I'm hard at work on another edition of Inner Sanctum, my free monthly newsletter. Inner Sanctum features my monthly brief, a column of my thoughts and opinions on what's happening in the world. It features a spotlight on a past guest, a look ahead to an upcoming episode of my weekly syndicated radio program, The Conspiracy Show. It features a look at this month in conspiracy and UFO history and my Conspiracy Unlimited podcast episode pick of the month and so much more. To get your free monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, delivered to your email inbox, just go to my website, strangeplanet.ca, strangeplanet.ca. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and click Click on Inner Sanctum and register. It's fast, easy, and again, absolutely free. If there's one thing money can't buy, it's sanity. <laughs> Conspiracy Unlimited with Richard Serrett. We are back with Mark Capel, documentary filmmaker, and it's called Skinwalker Ranch, Apocalypse Close Encounters, and... Uh, this fabled uh, track of land, 480-some acres, used to be called the UFO Ranch. And, I mean, these sightings uh, and these activities go back, oh, half a century probably. Um, and Mark ventured there in 2013, uninvited, uh, didn't attempt to trespass, but uh, uh, attempted to document some uh, paranormal activity sort of along the periphery uh, of the uh, of the ranch. And... Um, uh, we were talking about sort of the origin of the, the name Skinwalker and the Indian legend and so forth. I was in Albuquerque recently, uh, and the uh, near uh, Chaco Canyon National Monument. And my, uh, I was working on a TV show there, and my driver, I, I said to him, uh, because I'd never been to Albuquerque uh, and I wanted to explore a little bit, I said, are there any no-go zones in Albuquerque, places I need to watch out for? He said, oh, it's pretty safe. He said, just stay away from any pointed. I think it was uh, off in the southeast. And um, he said, I said, what's that? And he said, I, now I may be wrong. I believe he called it Hondo Valley. He said, stay away from there. And I said, why? And he said, well, people just disappear there. He said, I went to, f to high school with friends that disappeared out there in Hondo Valley. And then he started to talk to me about the Skinwalker uh, legend and uh, said that there was reportedly... Um, a group of uh, witches out there. This was near the Navajo um, reservation. And he said they that's where they apparently turn people into skinwalkers. Uh, so <laughs> I said, duly noted, I will not head off in that direction. Uh, and he went on to recount some other sort of creepy uh, things that had gone out did it down out there. But um, is it your understanding, Mark, that, that um, skinwalkers are... are I mean, how are they created? I mean, do they do, do people are people abducted? Are they turned into skinwalkers against their their against their will? How does this work? My understanding is that it's somebody that um, chooses that path themselves. Now they have to do something very bad, like kill a, a loved one, to obtain this power. They have to go through some kind of shamanic kind of ritual to obtain this power. Um, now, the people that do this uh, are doing it for very selfish reasons. 
And, um, you know, uh, you asked me before, um, you know, had I talked to uh, anyone about what the, the skinwalkers are? Well, it, it's something that people, uh, I, I know the tribes, that they don't really like to talk about because it's something that's apparently very evil. I mean, it's like something that you might find in, in voodoo or witchcraft kind of thing. Right, yeah. Um, unless you, I guess, are sort of welcomed into that community, they're going to be, they're going to play their cards very close to their vest. I would understand, understandably. I mean, that's kind of a dark secret. Uh, and so, what else? What else uh, did you did you document, um, either on film or audio recordings, while you were in and around the Skinwalker Ranch? Uh, I'd just like to go back to the, the first night uh, when I was um, sitting out there. I did capture some other things. Um, on camera, um, I, I might say the best thing I could describe them as some sort of plasma form that appeared uh, in the distance on camera and then disappeared very quickly and morphed away like a ghost. Um, you know, I know there were, there were thunderstorms uh, on the horizon. I thought, well, maybe there's something to do with that, but they were kind of really weird. Uh, one was kind of orange and almost like a face. Uh, and when you see it on, on film, it's kind of really weird. Like, what the heck could that be? Uh, so that's, you know, uh, something that I had captured um, that's just in the, the documentary. I had released some uh, other footage, a uh, shorter version of, of the uh, the current film. Now, it's legendary uh, on Skinwalker Ranch for people, or around Skinwalker Ranch, for people who are investigating to have difficulty with their equipment. Uh, what, whatever is behind all of this activity uh, apparently likes to, these gremlins like to affect audio and, and camera equipment. Did you have any difficulty that way? Um, I didn't have any difficulty, fortunately, but I have had on other investigations, I've had, uh, I'm pretty sensitive to energy around me. Um, I, I can sense if there's a, an entity that's really angry at me, I will sometimes pick up their response to me. They'll tell me to leave, and my equipment will all of a sudden malfunction. Like, I've had cameras, and I'll, I'll pick up this, this, this anger all of a sudden, and then my, my camera will stop working. I, I can't make it work until after the investigation. It's just really weird stuff like this. And this is very commonplace uh, in paranormal investigations. You know, if you can rule out that, well, in cold weather, cold weather does, you know, sap batteries. But... You, know, you can rule out that. Um, you know, you know, people go in there and they have, you know, film crews. They have, you know, fully charged batteries. All of a sudden, they're they're discharged. You know, there's a theory that perhaps these entities uh, are, are making use of uh, that energy source to uh, maybe manifest. You mentioned the uh, bulletproof wolf. Talk to me a little bit about that story. Okay, well, um, the first day that they moved in there, uh, they had strange things happen. And uh, my understanding is that they, uh, according to um, Colm Keller and um, George Knapp's book, uh, when they arrived on the property, they were unpacking their things. And um, I guess they were over by the corral there because uh, they had moved there to uh, breed this high-end um, stock. They noticed uh, this giant wolf that just kind of like meandered um, up to them uh, like it was a pet. Uh, it was really huge, and uh, it, it kind of approached them, wasn't afraid of them at all, and it uh, it walked all the way up to them, and uh, then it uh, approached uh, a calf. I guess it had its head out, out of the, the uh, fence there, and it actually attacked the calf around its throat. And now they were terrified about what happened, and, uh, the, you know, they tried kicking this wolf, I guess it was like a dire wolf. Now, these things haven't been seen in 10,000 years. Uh, this is an extinct um, creature. Uh, anyway, they're, they're, you know, they're trying to get this thing off their calf, and uh, it's ha they're having no avowal uh, trying to kick it off. And so um, he gets uh, his, his handgun, uh, and uh, he shoots at point-blank range. Uh, about three times. And this was a 357 Magnum, reportedly. This was a powerful gun. Correct. Yes, and you know that should have that should have got the thing off. It should have you know, killed it, and uh, that had no effect. It was a very little reaction, and uh, he um, had got his hunting rifle, 
Now he was a marksman and a hunter, very, very, uh, very good. To, he was used to uh, hunting game and that. Uh, and he uh, shot this thing uh, again with the hunting rifle, and uh, the, you know the, these rounds would have brought down an elk easily. Um, and this thing eventually let, let go of this poor calf that was ble- bleeding profusely, and it just started wandering off out into the pasture. And um, I guess they were stunned; they couldn't believe their eyes what had just happened. And uh, it just, uh, it, it, just to let you know, too, a piece of flesh had been shot off. Um, off of the wolf. Off the wolf. Off, off the wolf. After Correct. like, this is like after five or six slugs, right? Correct. Yes. Um, this thing should have been taken out. This, I knew there was something extremely strange about this event, and uh, so uh, this thing just well, wandered off, and they're like, "What the heck just happened?" So they, 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 they go after this wolf. And uh, it, it wanders off past, uh, you know, some trees. They're, they're trying to pursue it, and uh, I, I guess it goes through um, some thicket of, of trees and that's some pretty thick scrub. And they follow its tracks. It left some uh, left some deep, deep tracks um, in the mud uh, close to a waterway there, and then the tracks just suddenly disappeared. Um, and you know, the the wolf or whatever it was, you know, couldn't have jumped out of the way and just disappeared uh, they they figured uh, they, they tried to track it and they these uh, these prints just stopped and uh, uh, he went back and um, there's this uh, piece, a piece of rotting flesh um, on the ground um, you know very strange no blood and you know I'm, I'm thinking uh, you know, I read about this I'm thinking well you know is this something that's not alive and somehow been reanimated uh, there's no blood inside this thing, you know, you know not a, a normal biological creature. And I, and I understand that the, the, the piece of, of flesh that was the chunk that was blown off by one of the bullets, it, it smelled like rotten meat. Correct, yes. So, you know, what can you surmise from this? It, was it a, a dead creature that somehow, you know, who knows? It's, it's very bizarre. And I guess over the years, this this family uh, sort of reported a kind of a menagerie of, of weird animals that they saw. They, didn't they see something very similar to that animal attacking a horse? Uh, um, it was like a, uh, I think a, a, a wolf-like animal. I think they described it as a kind of a muscular hyena, weighed something like 200 pounds, they estimated. Yes, I, I've read of that story. Uh, apparently, the, the poor horse had got its legs cut um, some way. And whatever this, this uh, beast did, I, I, I don't know what actually happened to the beast afterwards, but uh, there was just an array of very strange events. It was very frightening events. Uh, tell me about uh, this Junior Hicks, um, who's kind of, I guess, the, uh, the amateur historian of the area. Um, yeah, what, yeah. Um, is he still around? And what did what did he tell you? Um, I didn't get to interview him. Um, just um, from accounts that I've read um, from publications and that, um, he was a um, a science teacher locally, and um, uh, I guess he was pretty high up in the, the local church there. And uh, um, uh, he had said that. Um, that there were a lot of uh, UFO sightings in the Uinta Basin, and uh, you know, ever since the 60, 60s and 70s, uh, there were probably more UFO sightings there uh, in the Uinta Basin than anywhere else in the world. He had gathered over 400 uh, reports from locals who had gone to him. Now, some of these accounts are uh, even the, the whole school had had seen these craft in broad daylight. And I, I've know, I know there's situations in other parts of the world, like in Australia and South Africa, where uh, schools have seen, um, you know, daytime, they had daytime sightings of, of uh, this craft. But now he was, uh, he, I understand that he got to um, uh, go onto the, the ranch in the early days. Um, I believe that NIDS uh, allowed him to work with them and... Um, he uh, went and investigated, um, you know, some of these like impressions in the grass, like circular impressions and triangular impressions. Just kind of really, you know, weird stuff. I, so I think had, I, had, I think I'd read where he had 
estimated that uh, of the 50,000 or so people who live in that basin, half of them had seen a UFO. 25,000 out of the 50,000 had seen a UFO in that area. That's quite remarkable. Yes, yes, there's a very high amount of people who have experienced things. And so if you ever go to the area, you know, if you live in that area, you know, there's a good chance that you're going to see something sometime. Now, I've had responses uh, from people uh, who, who lived next door to the Shermans who, who said this was nothing but a load of rubbish and it was made up uh, by the Shermans just to sell the property. And uh, I'm thinking, well, if you want to sell this property, uh, you don't make up stories about uh, creatures, uh, you know, killing the cattle and uh, all these other weird things. I think, if anything, that would detract most <laughs> people. Yes, under normal circumstances, that's true. Uh, are people flocking there? Has it become kind of uh, uh, like Area 51, where you've got a lot of of tourists and so forth who just are hoping to get a glimpse of things, not necessarily serious researchers, but just, I mean, has it become like a pilgrimage? Uh, yes, very much so. Uh, you know, anybody that's into the paranormal, I mean, if you don't know of Skinwalker Ranch, you're missing out on something. Now, you know, uh, you know, people could say, oh, well, it's just a you know, load, of road, load of rubbish, but, you know, why would Robert Bigelow, who owns an aerospace company, spend so much money and resources, uh, he had doctorate level scientists go and they, they, they set up a, a big operation to try to observe what was going on there. They had former astronauts, you know, physicists, engineers, uh, biologists. Uh, it was a pretty amazing, you know, private operation they, they had going there. Any plans to go back? Uh, I would love to go back, um, uh, just unable to at the, at the time. And uh, I'm curious about the uh, the subtitle of the, of the documentary, Apocalypse, Close Encounters. What do you mean by apocalypse? Well, apocalypse meaning, uh, well, at the time, I didn't realize something very strange had happened. Um, not until after, that, when I reviewed my footage, you know, what I had, these, these strange plasma-like anomalies that appeared. And um, I got voices calling out for help. Um, very, just very strange, non-human kinds of voices. Um, I, you know, that actually had approached me. Now, a lot of times when you're uh, recording um, what they call electronic voice phenomena or EVPs, um, you don't hear them at the time. Uh, not until you, you know, play back your footage. And there's different grades of EVPs. Uh, you know, you want to capture the best quality. You know, we can hear what they're saying very clearly. Uh, you know, I had one voice that said to me. Countdown to being poor, and I wonder if that was a premonition EVP. But just very strange things like that. I, I got like a screaming, um, like a woman screaming over the ghost box. Uh, I was doing a, uh, you know, towards the end of our investigation, I actually uh, transitioned spirits over um, because I've had some experiences. Uh, I had this, this sound like this woman that's screaming through the the ghost box and that and. Uh, I, I asked the spirits, you know, what's going on over here? I tried to gather intel about what's going on. You know, one of them said hell. Now, some other very interesting things that I got responses uh, about what was going on, um, and these were surprises to me. One was demon, which was repeated again and again, and Bigfoot. Fascinating. Uh, you know, it was just very kind of you know bizarre. You know, some of the things that the, the recordings. And if you listen to uh, recordings I've got. Um, they're very strange voices, um, you know, not normal tones of voice. Skinwalker Ranch, Apocalypse, Close Encounters. How can people see that again? Yes, just go to hauntedman.net. Thanks so much, Mark. A real pleasure. We'll talk again. Thank you for having me. A new Conspiracy Unlimited with Richard Serrett drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at conspiracyunlimitedpodcast.com. Blow your mind. That is all for now. Oh, and remember to share and give a five-star review because we have huge egos and need love. We're like cats. We need... We need constant petting. <laughs>